1789, and you've landed on a remote island in the South Pacific. Palm trees swaying, hermit crabs skittering across the sand, seabirds riding the salty breeze. The closest human settlement is nearly 400 nautical miles away across open ocean, and it'll stay that way until the International Space Station passes over your head in 1998. This was the pristine condition of the Pitcairn Island chain when the mutineers of the HMS Bounty and their prisoners made landfall 235 years ago. The British Crown generally disapproves of mutiny, so to avoid death by hanging, the mutineers decided to build a life on one of the most remote island chains in the world. After a large dose of murder, kidnapping, and general bedlam, this party of just 29 people managed to create a lasting community generations who, for the most part, would be disconnected from the rest of the world. 235 years later, their descendants are dealing with a very modern problem. Plastic pollution. In 2015, an island in the chain, Henderson Island, was discovered to have the highest density of plastic pollution ever recorded on the planet. This plastic waste didn't originate from the islanders. It floated to their beaches across the ocean from population centers around the world. This week, we interview the man who decided to do something about it. Brett Howell organized cleanup expeditions to Henderson Island in 2019 and 2024, and he has been where few of us will ever get to go. Welcome to Conservation Connection, where each week we do exactly what it sounds like, connect you to what's happening in the field of conservation. I'm Sarah Catherine. And I'm Chance. Okay, I've been really looking forward to the start of this season, season 10. All of the episodes came from our collaboration with EarthX. If you've been following our journey on Instagram, you may have seen some fun posts and stories from our time at the EarthX conference in April. And if you've been listening to Conservation Connection for a while, then you've definitely heard some previous episodes recorded at EarthX. Honestly, one of my favorite places to go and get stories at, because you never really know who you're going to get to talk to, but we've gotten some really cool heavy hitters. I mean, our last episode from last season, that was Sylvia Earle. Dr. Sylvia Earle is like the biggest name in oceanography that I know of. Yeah. It was super cool, and I love that we got to cover such a variety of topics this year at EarthX. I mean, we learned about tribal conservation, how bats interact with wind turbines, and decision science, which I didn't really even know was a thing. And we got to talk to the world's only heavy metal marine biologist, and if that's as intriguing to you as I think it is, you're going to love this upcoming season. So the stories that we got to tell... All focus around stuff like how we can live in harmony with nature, how our technology and our modern lifestyles have an impact on the environment, and how the people that we got to interview are just making tomorrow a better place. So we're just a couple of minutes into this episode, and you may have already noticed some really fun changes. Oh, we did something different? Yeah, I mean, you know, a whole <laughs> narrative cold open is a little different from what we've done in the past, but I'm really excited about it. I think it's opening up some fun avenues we're always trying to improve the show, so getting to like really dive into the storytelling aspect behind the science and the work that our guests do has been really fun. So we're going to do cold opens, just a little bit of fun storytelling at the start, and then we're also going to do a little bit of voiceover context during the interviews themselves. Don't worry, there's still the mostly uncut, fly-on-the-wall style conversations that we've done the whole time, but just with a little bit more fun sprinkled in. It was a lot of fun to see you dive into your theater degree with the whole script writing thing we're doing at the beginning now. Heck yeah, baby. I did <laughs> take a course called playwriting, and I had a lot of fun with it, and I've had a lot of fun using it uh, to tell these really cool stories. Yeah, it was a really fun addition for us, so we hope you like it. And if you're new here, if this is your first episode you've ever, ever heard of Conservation Connection, then yeah, it's always been this way, so have fun. <laughs> and don't listen to any other episodes. <laughs> No, you should totally listen. They're great. Okay, so to sort of get us into the mindset for this episode, I've got a question for you. Okay. So last summer, uh, we got to celebrate our fifth wedding anniversary by booking some tickets during hurricane season because they were very <laughs> inexpensive to the island nation of Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean. It was an absolute blast. And my question for you is, what is your favorite memory from that week that we got to spend out there? 
Hmm. Well, that is a great question. And I can start with what my favorite memory is not. (laughs) And that would be um, traveling. So we stayed on the island of Antigua. We traveled over to the island of Barbuda, which was probably like an hour boat ride, if I'm remembering correctly. And the boat ride there was okay. I napped. Uh, Coming back, though, was a little more rough, and that did not go well for me. Well, especially because Hurricane Lee had just passed right by. Again, remember hurricane season, cheap tickets. But that did mean that the sea state was pretty rough for you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got seasick. It wasn't great. But my favorite memory was we uh, got to do some really awesome snorkeling while we were there. Like, we swam out from this one beach that we had heard about, and there was really no one else there. And we didn't have to swim out too, too far. But once we got a little further out from the beach, we were just like surrounded by these pillars of coral and all these fish. And it was so cool. That was definitely my favorite part. What about you? My favorite, I'm glad you brought up the trip to Barbuda because (laughs) um, for me, I was fine in the seasickness thing. I, you know, that didn't really bother me. I felt bad for you, but Getting to go out there and see that nesting site for all of the frigate birds was so cool. Okay, so to to back up and give a little context, the nation of Antigua and Barbuda has about 100,000 people that live on it, and more than 97% of them live in Antigua. So that's like where pretty much everybody is, and Barbuda has, I don't know, maybe 1,500 people that live there. So it's this tiny very self-sustaining community. They do a lot of fishing for sustenance and for export. Um, And because it's so mostly natural, seabirds have incredible nesting sites there. So the Magnificent Frigate Bird is the full species name. Uh, They've got a wingspan up to seven, eight feet. They're jet black. They've got massive hooked bills. And the males during breeding season have this bright red, it's called a gular pouch, that they inflate. It's at their neck or their chest. And they inflate it and say, like, look how big and awesome and pretty I am. Don't you want to make babies? (laughs) And so we got to ride in this little, I mean, it was a big canoe, basically, with an outboard motor on the back. There were just maybe seven of us on the boat. And we went into the mangroves and got to see this nesting community and be like, right literally within arm's reach of what are essentially pterodactyls (laughs) yeah i mean that was just such an incredible moment i loved that even though the trip over there was a little rough it was definitely worth it and i would highly recommend it if you ever get the chance yeah yeah totally agree with that and the reason that i brought it up now for this episode is that one of the other really strong memories i have on barbuda was do you remember our, our tour guide frank Yes, he was was great. He was awesome, told really cool stories. When we stopped by that cave system that that we then hiked up in, but remember we stopped at the van, we were overlooking at this this windswept beach, and he saw this giant piece of styrofoam Mm -hmm. that had just washed up on the beach, and he walked over to it. Like, he literally stopped the tour. (laughs) He was like, hold on a sec, guys. Walked over to this giant piece of styrofoam, and then was like, all right, I'm going to come back and get this later. Yeah, he was like, oh, I might be able to use that for something. Exactly. Like when I saw it, I was like, oh, look at all this plastic pollution. Look at this trash. He saw it as like, look at this resource that has appeared. And yes, it is pollution. And yes, it's causing problems. But I can use this for projects around the house and I don't have to buy something. And for me, that ties in really well with this whole story of Brett Howell and the plastic cleanup that he did on the one of the most remote beaches in the world, and the beach with the highest density of plastic pollution anywhere on the planet. Yeah, I totally agree that that definitely ties in. I hadn't even thought of that story before you just brought it up. And one of the reasons I wanted to interview Brett when I saw, so for our listeners, when we curate a season, we look at all of these people we want to talk to, we go through names, especially when we're going to a conference, we look at everybody and we're like, okay, who fits? Who do we think would be an interesting story to tell for our listeners? So I was going through speakers, I ran across Brett and the Howell Conservation Fund, And I saw that part of how they run their business is with the heart of a nonprofit, the mind of a business, and the network of a philanthropy. So I immediately thought that was cool because I was like, okay, this is something we've talked about before, that good things can be profitable. So that drew me in. And then I saw that they had done this crazy 
plastic cleanup expedition. And I was like, okay, we definitely have to tell this story. Yeah. And it was, I mean, as somebody who loves the ocean and sailing and sort of like the idea of visiting these remote locations, it was just like such a blast to get to talk with a guy who's done it twice and sort of turned this crazy idea of taking an expedition to one of the most remote places in the world and cleaning up trash into a reality. So we don't want to give too much of this story away, so we'll go ahead and get into the show. But right before that, I do want to call out a couple of really amazing people that have shouted us out on Instagram, left reviews for us. So the first one is Sarah from 25 Sweet Pea, a shop in St. Augustine. Uh, You should definitely check her out. She makes some really cool stickers. And she tagged us in one of her stories saying that she loves listening to the podcast on her morning walks, which just made us feel so good and happy, you guys. So I mean, like, if you want to make me tear up, literally, (laughs) this is not exaggeration. If you want to make me tear up, tag us on Instagram and be like, oh, I really enjoyed this episode. It really meant a lot to me because getting to hear that all of the hours that we pour into (laughs) these interviews and the storytelling is making a difference is like the highlight of my day. Yes, 100%. And the other one is Vanessa, who is a tree biology grad student. She just tagged us in a reel that she made highlighting some of her favorite ecology podcasts and included us with three other amazing podcasts. So go check her out for sure. Thank you guys so much for, you know, leaving us reviews, comments. It's wonderful. And if you want to hear your name shouted out on the podcast, go leave us a review or tag us or like let us know. Yeah, super happy to get to shout out the people who show us some love. We really, really appreciate it. Anyway, with that, I hope you guys enjoy this interview with Brett Howell of Howell Conservation Fund. Today, we're here at EarthX, and we have the honor of having Brett Howell, the founder and executive director of the Howell Conservation Fund, joining us. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I know you've had a crazy week. Obviously, we had Earth Day on Monday, and when you know we have Earth Week, there's lots of relevant events in our field going on. So I'm glad you could make it to EarthX. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic to be back. It's been a few years since I was at EarthX. Yeah, we love EarthX. It's such a great place to really interact with every stakeholder in the environmental space, whether that's people who are lifelong activists or, you know, people from ExxonMobil who are trying to find new technology. You know, you really can find everybody here at EarthX. It's a really cool experience. Do you want to talk a little bit about what brings you specifically to EarthX this year? Absolutely. So really this year with EarthX, it's because the oceans track. And I think they've tried that version a couple different times, but it was really wonderful to be here last night watching the ocean exchange. I think that was the first ever kind of combination of ocean exchange and EarthX. Uh, I've been fortunate to be involved and know of ocean exchange for a while. They really work to accelerate new ideas and then having the opportunity to be on this podcast and then speaking this afternoon about the intersection of climate and oceans and what we do at Howell Conservation Fund. That's fantastic. And if you guys have been listening for, you know, since last season, uh, Kathy Saucas was actually on the show, one of the founders of Ocean Exchange, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so it's a really, really cool organization. Glad you guys have a good relationship with them. And uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about what is going on with Howell Conservation Fund. Sure. So I have always been a conservationist since my youth growing up in coastal California. My parents ran out of reasons I wasn't allowed to scuba dive at 14 <laughs> after going to Indonesia and Australia as part of my dad's sabbatical when I was younger and really observing how Australia at the time had a very strong coral reef conservation philosophy. And then the counter to that being Indonesia and watching the results of dynamite fishing and really bringing tears to my eyes. I still have a jar of the sand from that beach, so I will never forget that moment. Everything I have done has been at the intersection of business and the environment. And in 2019, building on my experience in nonprofit, for-profit, and philanthropy, it made sense to really create a new entity, right? I've always had this vision of how can I make the biggest impact on the world? Our viewpoint is that we wanna achieve breakthrough conservation outcomes, and then we can do that at intersections. So we talk about ourselves as having the heart of a nonprofit, the mindset of a business, and the network of a philanthropy, because we really do all of those activities under the roof of one entity, Howell Conservation Fund, US 501c3 nonprofit. I think that's, 
first of all, you're very well spoken and clearly know what you're talking about. And I love <laughs> the you. story of how you kind of got inspired to go into this field of conservation. And I think it's something that we're seeing more of where it's like, you know, every single conservation platform, and obviously you do have your 501c3 status, but every single platform doesn't have to be a nonprofit, right? Like saving the planet can be profitable. I, I kind of think that that's a trend that we've been seeing maybe over the last 10 years of, you know, for a very long time, especially in the environmental world, it was like, Nonprofits are the only way to save the world. We have to rely on people loving trees in order to protect trees. And, you know, we'll never make money, but we'll do good for the world. And that is very noble and it's lovely. And I don't discourage anybody from doing that. But I, we've seen that that is not keeping up with the damage that's happening. And until we motivate massive groups of people by telling them your bottom line will get better and the environment will get better at the same time. It's the same thing. That's how we really get people on board because you can't expect the masses or businesses to sacrifice their livelihoods on the altar of environmental safety. But we can ask them to work with us to increase the stability of their livelihood and increase the environment, you know, make that better. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, our viewpoint is that collaboration is what is going to solve these problems, right? We spend about half of our time working on plastic pollution solutions. And in a sense, I like to say that we had to collaborate to get the earth to where it is now. We didn't intend for it, but we can now have positive collaboration through events like EarthX, through finally these ideas of regeneration that are really kind of spanning. It was really interesting to hear some of the pitches from uh, the teams yesterday, you know, with Ocean Exchange, I've been fortunate to hear some of those before in their end of 2023 events. And, you know, it's interesting how though each of those groups is iterated even more, right? Like thematically, I would say it's how do we heal nature? How do we live more in balance? To add some context, Ocean Exchange is an award program. Each year, they fund projects that can create a positive impact on the ocean and blue economy. In 2023, one of the winning projects was Remora Technical. Using biomimicry, they came up with a better way to attach tracking tags to marine animals. By creating an adhesive base inspired by the remora, you know the funny-looking fish that you see attached to whales and sharks? The tracking device can hold on for longer, collecting more data without potentially harming the animal. All of this to say, Chance and I will definitely be looking to do a biomimicry episode soon. I would like to talk more about the plastic pollution projects that y'all have going on specifically? Absolutely. So the project that really put us on the map was the Henderson Island Expedition 2019. In I believe it was 2015, some bird scientists spent a long-term duration, about six months on Henderson Island. And I think it was on a weekend, you know, they were on North Beach. East Beach is rather hard to get to, requires some hiking, recreating of trails. They went over, did some transects, did some math, and published in, I believe, 2017 that Henderson Island was the world's most plastic polluted beach by density, which is a mind-numbing thing to consider because it's a world heritage site that is uninhabited. When you are on this island, it is one of the remote, most remote islands in the world. Yeah. And, I mean, that that's not an exaggeration. It's not an exaggeration. I mean, when literally when you stand on that beach, your next closest human is the International Space Station if it's in the right point in the sky. Not, wow. that it, not that that would be the easiest human to get to, but distance wise, that's where it is. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, Chance pulled it up on like, you know, on the map on our phone and was like, this is how far it is from literally anything. Like, it's crazy that this landmass can just be out right there in the middle of the ocean, close to nothing. And the fact that it can be so polluted. So exactly. I know you know how that happens. So yes. <laughs> inform us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's our inability to manage waste, right? I mean, ocean currents have been around since the beginning of time. They've moved things around. That's why we have tides. That's why we have the species we do. They also do a phenomenal job of moving around large, small, et cetera, pieces of plastic because of where Henderson Island sits between South America and New Zealand and sort of that conveyor belt, unfortunately, East Beach is highly, highly polluted. That's a really important point that Brett just made. 
Henderson Island just happens to be sitting smack dab in the flow of the South Pacific Gyre, which is a massive current that moves water counterclockwise. If you dropped a rubber ducky in the ocean off of New Zealand, the South Pacific Gyre would carry that ducky to the east, past Antarctica, north up the coast of South America, westward along the equator, and then south until it ended up right back where it started. It's basically a giant lazy river. And since Henderson Island sits right in the middle of the gyre's flow, a lot of the plastic and trash that gets caught in that current end up washing ashore. It's kind of like how the dog hair in my house moves around. Because I walk the same pathways and I move the air in the same way, the dog hair ends up collecting in corners rather than being scattered everywhere. Henderson Island is the collection corner of the South Pacific gyre. It's easy to picture this problem as a massive island of plastic that you could walk across, but the truth is that it's mostly invisible. While there are big things like buoys and fishing nets, a lot of the plastic is broken up pieces of single-use items that range in size from a bottle cap to smaller than a grain of rice. That's part of why it's so hard to clean up, as Brett goes on to say. No, I mean, I get asked that question quite a bit. They're like, why don't you just go out to the island and pick it up? It's like, you know. <laughs> yeah, just unfor- skip it all up. Right. You know, as one of the scientists from the 2019 expedition said, you know, plastic doesn't break down, it breaks up. So that's how we get to these microplastics. They get smaller and smaller. My understanding is that really, you know, in those gyres, you have kind of, you know, ocean surface to maybe 10 feet or so. You have significant distribution, obviously. We have now found plastic everywhere, even the deepest point in the ocean, right? Yeah. Um, So, you know, it's so pervasive. There's actually new ecosystems. If you really want to use that term, it feels, I don't know, dirty to me to call it that way, where, you know, where you're having animals being able to transport via this plastic that they used not to be able to do. And that's creating, you know, more challenges for an already stressed ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see things like hermit crabs using pieces of plastic as like shells, essentially. And all of these like organisms that rely, you know, would use like sargassum or floating seaweed are now able to use floating plastics as a route of transportation as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because Dr. Jen Lavers, who is the bird scientist who published this paper, her photo, if memory serves, the 2017 paper actually had an image of a hermit crab using you know, a piece of plastic as a shell mm-hmm. instead of a shell being a shell. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of one of those images that was pervasive of like, hey, this is why we're doing this expedition. Yeah. It's great for them to have a shell, but we don't want that shell to be made out of plastic. We want it to be an actual shell. Exactly. Um, so like you said, you can't just go out in the ocean and scoop all this stuff up and yay, it's all done. And it would be great if it worked that way. And there are different organizations that are working on new technologies to get as much of that out as we can. But you and your team went out in 2019 and were able to clean up the island completely. Is that right? Yeah. So we went in 2019 in June and we're able to clean it down to bottle cap size. There was a lot of different work streams on that from a plastic pollution artist that, frankly, I didn't even know was a job title before that expedition <laughs> yeah. uh, to some people with uh, Protect Blue and other organizations doing underwater videography. Uh, they ended up removing at least one fishing aggregation device, which is really sad because this is one of the world's largest marine protected areas. I was the beach cleanup team leader, and we unfortunately, while we could collect that waste, We couldn't get it off the island because on the first try of bringing in the rigid hull inflatable boat to drop the media team off on the way out, that boat unfortunately flipped. Mm. That was ironic because the prop caught in rope that was stuck in the reef, went sideways. It flipped. Thankfully, the two Royal Marines were on the boat. They were part of kind of media and they were able to help recover that. But we had unexpected castaways on the island that night. Oh my and gosh. Then, you know, if you want to have a story go global, make your journalists sleep on the beach. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like, if I learned anything, story. it was one of those accidental story arcs, right? Yeah. So uh, Stuff Media did a really nice job. They had a writer and a photographer, videographer. They did a very nice job, did a three-part story that ended up really going global. And so part of it was done, but not all of it was done. In the past five years, I'd always felt, hey, I'd made this commitment. How do we go back? We have to finish this work. And an opportunity came up in the end of last year to finally do that return. 
after working with the UK government, uh, British government, for those that aren't familiar with what UK means. Uh, it's part of the British Overseas Territory, as we were talking about with Pitcairn. It's crazy. They're direct descendants from the mutiny on the bounty, which goes back. We're going to get into that because that's awesome. wild. <laughs> awesome. But, you know, I kind of answer your original question. Yeah, you know, there was always this intent of how do we go back? This isn't done. You know, various media interviews I've given, I've said we're going to finish this job. And finally, this year, we had the opportunity to do that. And we finally did successfully get both the waves from 2019 and all the waves that's accumulated 2019 to 2024 off. That's absolutely amazing. And before we talk about the mutiny on the bounty, which I know Chance really wants to get into. <laughs> I'm like sitting here vibrating, like waiting for that moment. <laughs> um, I do want to ask. So this kind of question came up as Chance and I were talking about this episode is, as we mentioned, this island is just sitting there in the middle of the ocean. And you also mentioned the rib, the inflatable boat that flipped that you couldn't get the people or the trash on and off the island. So how did you even get out there in the first place? Did you have to like take a boat from California? Did you fly to one point and then take a boat from there? Parachute. What was yeah, right. parachute. Right. Parachute. Right. yeah, what was that like? Yeah, so we kind of joke was planes, trains, automobiles, and expedition ships, right? <laughs> uh, you essentially the way to get there is you get to Tahiti from wherever you start. You jump on a prop plane for I think it's like four to six hours. You have one stop on a very very remote location and end up in the Gambier Islands in a place called Mangareva, if I'm pronouncing this correctly. <laughs> Jump on in the 2019. It was the Silver Supporter, which is a ship run by the British government to help support the people of Pitcairn. Uh, because the Pitcairn community is so remote, they actually have to have food resupply from New Zealand of all places four wow. times a year. It's very interesting how this is run because the Pitcairn Islands are British territory but the government sits in New Zealand and it's co-run with somebody on Pitcairn who's a member of the Pitcairn community. So it's a very far distance. I think it's about 5,000 miles one way from Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm based. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's not a simple journey. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been a sailor for many years. I used to work in the British Virgin Islands um, doing live aboard scuba instruction and sea turtle tagging with students. And when I was in college, we figured out that it was cheaper for me to buy an older sailboat and put it on a dock at a lake by campus and live on that for two years than it was for me to live in the dorms for four semesters. So I did that for, uh, you know, lived aboard for two years and was, I ap applied for a fellowship to take that boat from where I was to New Zealand and back to the west coast of the United States over the course of a year as a solo sailor, which in retrospect, I definitely did not have the chops to do. So it's probably good that I didn't get that fellowship. But um, as you know, I had to I had to like submit a proposal of this is how long it takes me to get through the Panama Canal and then to Galapagos, then down to Easter Island. And then the single longest crossing was from Easter Island to Pitcairn would have been, I think, a 22 day oceanic crossing. And um, it is just wild how remote this island is and the fact that it is populated, that there's people that live there, were born there, will die there and spend their whole lives on Pitcairn is logistically difficult to comprehend just because of its remoteness. Yeah, it just blows me away. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. It's one of the, you know, I feel extremely privileged that I have gone to Pitcairn Island twice in my life. I don't suspect unless the universe gives me some reason to go back that I will be a third time, but it was an incredible opportunity and I really appreciate both chances. Yeah. This feels like a good time to explain why there are people living on the Pitcairn Islands today. Back in the 1780s, a sailing vessel named the HMS Bounty was sent by the British Crown on a botanical expedition to the South Pacific. Their goal was to collect breadfruit trees, which thrive in island environments and grow nutritious fruit and they were going to take those trees to the Caribbean as a food source for their colonies. If you hadn't guessed by now, the bounty was never fated to complete her mission. This is a story that's been told countless times, but depending on which accounts you read, the captain of the bounty, a man named William Bly, was unnecessarily strict on his men. This made him pretty unpopular, and it led to an uprising. One night, about half the crew, led by Fletcher Christian, took control of the ship put the captain and 18 loyalists into a small open boat, and set them adrift. Amazingly, 
Captain Blind navigated this open boat several thousand miles back to Australia, while Christian and the mutineers kept the bounty. The rebels now had the task of figuring out how to avoid punishment for their crimes. A group of them settled in Tahiti and were eventually found and imprisoned. But nine of the mutineers and 20 unwitting Tahitian islanders instead chose to find somewhere they could live out their days undiscovered. They knew the island of Pitcairn was uninhabited, and they set sail to see if it would meet their needs. While searching for it, they realized that the location of the island had been recorded incorrectly on the official charts. The actual location was nearly 200 nautical miles further east. With plenty of water, fertile soil, and an archival error to help keep them hidden, they made landfall, burned the bounty, and set about building a hidden community separated from the rest of the world. As it turns out, a bunch of mutineers make for pretty contentious company, and by the time they were discovered two decades later, all but one of the original rebels had been murdered, killed themselves, or had succumbed to disease. The people who remained were the children of the mutineers and the Tahitian women who had been taken captive, and by 1814, they had established a thriving community of 46 people. As Brett found out, their lineage continues today. Somehow, here in 2024, we still have about 40 inhabitants of Pitcairn Island that are direct descendants of the original mutineers. Uh, it's crazy because I made sure to get a fridge magnet each time. And, you know, it shows like fill in the blank generation, sixth, seventh, and then, yeah, the last name. And as you read these books, you're like, oh, you're like the direct descendant of one of the lead mutineers. Like, pretty crazy. <laughs> One of the things that I find so interesting about the story of the Pitcairn Islands is that it starts with isolation. It was chosen by the mutineers because they believed that they could live out the rest of their lives without being found by the most powerful navy that the world had ever seen. And it worked. But today, that same island is connected to the rest of the world in such an unexpected way, as the receptacle of plastic waste from thousands of miles away. We are so globally connected in this modern era, even without technology. It's the Earth's systems that are connecting us, the literal currents of the ocean that bridge the gap between people across thousands of miles of water. It's the reality of life in 2024, and people like Brett are working to make sure that we leave our planet better than we found it. And yeah, the ultimate irony here is in the 2019 expedition, we discovered that Henderson Island was in the wrong place on the map. <laughs> uh, really? Yeah, uh, because, you know, as you're standing on the bridge, the thing's giving you warnings, like you're about to hit land, you're about to hit land, we're fairly well offshore. I forget what news article did a story on it, but it was the, like something like, you know, Henderson Island been in the wrong place on the map for like 90 years, right? So like the British government, like there's just this interesting continuing theme, Pitcairn, wrong place on map, Henderson, wrong place on map. Well, it's incredibly difficult to get it right when you're in the middle of the ocean, right? I mean, exactly. it is especially before we had modern technology, but apparently even now that we do have modern technology, like getting things charted correctly is very difficult. Right. And it's also, you know, what's the priority, right? It's an uninhabited yeah. World Heritage Site. How many people go there? You know, right. A handful. Yeah. It's like no one had been there in a while, so there wasn't a reason to be like, oh, yes, this is the right latitude and longitude. Yeah. Exactly. Could you, I would love to, from your perspective, hear a little bit about what it was like to stand on the beach in Henderson Island and, and you know, what did you see? What did you smell? What did it look like? How did it feel? That kind of like, what was your experience of being on one of the most remote islands in the world and cleaning up uh, plastic pollution? Sure. So I feel extremely fortunate that I'm one of the few people on the planet that has been there twice to run beach cleanups in this sense. Both of them had similarities. Both of them were also extremely different. But to your question, you know, it ultimately like it just tears at your heartstrings, right? Because this is this beautiful, uninhabited island there's hermit crabs everywhere. There's these different endemic bird species. You know, they're flying over you. They're calling out. They're kind of doing what birds should be doing, right? And you're walking down the beach thinking, oh, this is beautiful, untouched. Except that when you look down, you are just surrounded by the detritus of humankind. Every possible kind of thing you think you can see is plastic. And that 
is ultimately the challenge. That's ultimately what motivates me to go back to do things like having this conversation, because for us, it's not about a cleanup, right? It's fantastic that the beach is clean for now. It's really about raising the human consciousness about our choices and what's happening with plastic, what's happening with waste more broadly, and how we as a species have said, hey, our convenience is number one, and we don't care what we do to the rest of the planet as a result of it. Yeah. And that's actually a point I wanted to go back and touch on. So you said, okay, we were there in 2019. We were there again this year in 2024. You shouldn't really have to go back. Do you think that we're at a point where we won't necessarily keep getting plastic, like getting dumped by tides and such on this island? And that's why you don't think we'll go back? Or do you kind of a two-part question. Do you think we're progressing enough that we have less of a plastic issue in the ocean? And if not, how can people kind of help to, because I'm sure that some of the work you do too, right, is obviously spreading this awareness of, okay, here's how you can help. Here's what we can do to make this better. Exactly. So catch me if I don't answer all of it. I know, it's a multi-part question. question. (laughs) But, you know, what I would start with is saying everything that Howell Conservation Fund does is science-based, right? So in 2019, we took, uh, it was UK and I believe Australian scientists with us, actually the bird scientists that had done the math, figured out this was the world's most plastic polluted place. And they continued that work, right? So we got scientific publication out of that. In 2024, Howell Conservation Fund made sure we took a plastic pollution scientist with us to repeat aspects of what was done in 2015, 2019, and now 2024. So you have those data sets that you can look at. Our scientist, her background is more plastic pollution solution innovations. That's what her PhD was in. She felt comfortable enough collaborating with the other scientists to make sure we could replicate what that goes against. Not being a scientist, but looking from the perspective of the birds and the hermit crabs we just talked about, unfortunately, We left the beach in 2019 bottle cap clean, right? It looked like, you know, what a beach, any normal human would think a beach would look like. Showing back up, 2024, beach was trashed again, right? So it's not exactly the same weight. You know, there was less buoys in 2024 than 2019, so on and so forth. But if you're a hermit crab trying to walk down to the beach from wherever you live up inland, you're running into plastic. If you're a bird, there's plastic everywhere. So approximately five years, the beach is going to be trashed again. That's really sad to know that by 2029, you know, it's going to be trashed. And it's interesting because the UN sustainable development goals are all about 2030. And I sort of tie that, you know, in my brain, it's like, okay, Henderson will be trashed again by 2029. And it's just, you know, kind of concerning. But to your point, why do I think I won't go back You know, we led two massive international expeditions, each cost north of 500,000 U.S. dollars. You had teams from Europe, from the United States, all over the place come in. It's one of those great juxtapositions. You're having a massive climate impact to get to this place. We've talked about how remote it is. Driving ships to go clean up this plastic and now understanding, my goodness, really five years, that's it. Yeah. So I think the wins for us coming out of this is that we took the Pitcairn community very hard to get anybody in alignment when you have a community of 40 people and so many demands. We started with, yeah, we're not interested in Henderson Island at all through a lot of conversations over the years, lots of stops and starts about possible return expeditions, including COVID, right, which shut their islands down for two to three years or something to really having the community actually be positively engaged, right? And it was kind of a happy coincidence that the boat we were talking about, the Silver Supporter, was in that general area during this expedition. We used a different vessel for the 2024 expedition, but they actually helped and took about half the weight. They took all the fishing buoys. They took all the fishing nets. They took that back to Pitcairn Island. They were originally then going to put it on another boat called Aranui 5, which is this crazy half cargo, half cruise ship thing. (laughs) But instead, the community decided to say, hey, we want to keep this. And they actually were able to get a shredder going that we bought as part of the 2019 expedition. We got them engaged. UK government has supported building of a science lab. 
Very in the cool. five years since. So what wow. I think the solution is now is instead of these kind of large expeditions, kind of, hey, we're going to come save you, which in my opinion doesn't really look that great anyway in the modern world, I think in how conservation thinks and really a lot of what we do is like, how do you do this from a local perspective that we are providing global oversight, we're helping raise money for you, we're helping really do what we can from outside, but it's not the people at Pitcairn's plastic. Like, as we've talked about, that's clear. It's global plastic. But now that we've gotten them excited and engaged as a community, it's about 110 miles from Pitcairn Island to Henderson Island, right? They had already done some trips over there. They're trying to do more tourism with Silver Supporter. It's a unique also half cargo, half passenger vessel. So that's where it makes me feel like after two global expeditions, we've given the locals the tools they need. They have the empowerment. They get a lot of support from the UK government as well financially. The UK government's done a very nice job with the marine protected areas in that region. And I really think this is now a how do we get the community to go back? I don't know what cadence. Is it every six months? Is it once a year, kind of going back to your point, if you let the dog hair accumulate in the currents for a year, your house is going to be trash. But if somebody, if you just had a deep clean done, why not pick things up along the way and not have to do another deep clean five years later? Right, right. right. A lot less logistically difficult to get all of the stuff off of the island and dealt with if you're doing it at a regular cadence than it is to wait until it piles up and piles up and piles up and then deal with it. Absolutely. Exactly. And I think one of the other really you know, from an outsider's perspective, one of the other really valuable things that has come out of your work on Henderson Island is a model or a story for the world to talk about global plastic pollution, right? There's, we both come from, you know, animal husbandry backgrounds, zoos and aquariums. And there's always this conversation of like, why are we keeping animals out of their natural environment? And the, the purpose of zoos and aquaria are to create opportunities for people to engage with nature in a way that builds a relationship between them and that animal and changes their behavior in a way that helps protect that animal's way of life out in the wild. In much the same way, forcing a journalist to sleep on the beach <laughs> and getting global news coverage, forcing being not the right word, but <laughs> right, right. In a, a happy circumstance, having the journalists have such a massive experience and bringing global awareness to this issue, it helps more than just Henderson Island. It helps more than just Pitcairn. It helps beaches across the world because it creates opportunities for people to change their behavior and their choices around plastic consumption that ultimately is what we need to, to resolve the plastic crisis in the oceans, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we use the term root cause a lot of the time, right? Look at what is causing this. It's the production of plastic, right? I mean, if you just look at how exponential that growth has been, and I'm sure we've all read the studies, there's supposed to be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. I think Dr. Jenna Jambach out of Georgia did a really nice job in science communication, raising awareness around those issues. Not going to get these stats exactly right, but, you know, we made approximately, I think, the same amount of plastic from like 1950 to, say, 2003, as we did from 2003 to the mid-2015s or something, right? We just keep opening more and more plastic production plants before these global wars as oil was hitting a certain point, right? Petrochemical companies were saying, hey, where's the next revenue source here? I believe it was maybe The Economist or somebody did a really interesting article on it of saying, you know, they figured out that the growth is in plastic production. As opposed to fuel production. Right. And, you know, it's all petrochemicals and the unfortunate thing for nature and really now human health. And I think that's where we're going to hit that pivot point of people realizing is that plastic is now an air pollutant, right? There's microplastic everywhere, right? Uh, it's been found in our blood, etc. Uh, Edward Humes released, I think pretty recently, a book called Total Garbage. And <laughs> I'm not all the way through it yet. Uh, his other book, Eco Barons, was really influential for me, talking about how people have done extreme good uh, in the world through the environment. 
And I think it's fascinating for anybody interested in this topic of plastic, what it's doing to us, what it's doing to the planet. It's a great read. Pick up a copy. For your average person, obviously, a lot of this always comes back down to, okay, how can we change how our industries and stuff like that, like, how do we change how they're acting, what they're doing, what they're producing? But what can the average person do to kind of help with this issue? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one that I'm asked quite a bit, right? I'm sure. So (laughs) for me, I think step one is becoming conscious of it. Right. And sort of being out like I remember in my youth, I grew up in California, right, walking down the beach and seeing seashells. That was normal. Right. I now cannot walk down a beach without making sure that I previously have some ideally eco friendly bag because I know just how much plastic is going to show up there. Right. Kids today don't understand, I think, that you're not supposed to see plastic on a beach. I think it's part of what it's supposed to be. Right. So. After you realize and can start seeing these things, for me, it's a fun journey to saying, okay, like, how can I challenge myself today to be slightly more eco-friendly? Or, you know, what can I do, right? So, like, perfect example, and I love EarthX, but it's common with conferences. It's like, we are talking about conservation. Why is beef being served for dinner last night, right? Beef has been proven to be one of the highest climate impact things. I get we're in Texas. It's all about (laughs) beef, but it was very simple to say, I'd like vegetarian, please. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, you know, I travel more than I like, but I make sure that I'm traveling with reusable water bottle. I've got my reusable coffee mug. I've got my bamboo silverware. Let's you avoid a lot of that waste, right? So it's really kind of that consciousness of saying, do I care about waste or what is my topic I care about, right? In my case, I've chosen waste, plastic pollution. How do we get to positive solutions through environmental entrepreneurship? It can be as simple as taking, you know, start with a grocery bag, right? Use a reusable grocery bag as opposed to these plastic film things that are incredibly hard to recycle. But I think it's less about me saying, hey, here's a list of 50 things to do and more kind of raising consciousness, which is why we talk about it that way, to have people kind of have that light bulb, right? Like the speaker last night, it was really interesting at dinner for him to say, like, I hadn't really thought about the environment before because of his life situation, but as personal things were really challenging for him. I think it was in Colorado. He started noticing the changes in a place he'd been as maybe a child with what was happening with the Beatles, which was a direct result of climate change as things aren't getting cold enough to kill them and kind of light bulbs went off and now he's involved with earth X and he's an influencer, right? Like we all come at this through such different journeys, right? But it's about what is that spark? And through that spark, how do you challenge yourself? And after you've challenged yourself, how do you challenge your friends? And after you challenge your friends, how do you challenge your community? And so on and more and more global, right? Right. And understanding your personal capacity. Because I I think it's very easy to feel overwhelmed and be like, oh, I I have to avoid plastic waste and I should be changing my diet and I should be composting and I should be biking. And it's like I should be living this completely different lifestyle than I currently am. And we live in a system that that does not make it easy to make environmental choices because convenience sells. And so it's it's what's available on the marketplace. And so you're, you're kind of swimming upstream. But it's important to remember that you don't have to do everything all at once all the time. Doing what you can on the days that you can do it is better than not doing anything ever. You know, simple, tiny, you know, small steps in the right direction eventually get you to your goal. Exactly. And I would also say, do what feels joyful, right? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't think about it as sacrifice. Like, you know, I don't miss the beef I didn't eat last night, right? Like, to me, it's, hey, I'm living in alignment with my values. And through that, I'm able to do more and more of it. Like, I started my own challenges with myself. Uh, Josh Spodek, somebody out of New York City, uh, really admire him. He's gone you know, probably one of the leaders and going like completely off grid, creating no trash, et cetera. If you haven't talked to him, he may be a super interesting person to talk to for your podcast. Yeah. Happy to make an introduction. But, you know, he helped me kind of start thinking about things. And, you know, I read about Meatless Monday and in 2017, I started doing that and kind of gave me, you know, another example of like, my goodness, we do not need this much protein in our life. Right. right. And probably dropped it, I don't know, 90% or something, right. For animal placed 
protein, right? right? Like when you, especially when you travel, sometimes it's hard to find vegetarian meals. So there's a little bit still in my diet, but it's like, find joy. Don't make it feel like it's sacrifice. Don't feel like somebody else is dictating you to do this and go see what challenges you want. Like you can do and right. Who yeah. knows what's going to happen. Yeah. I love that. I'd be very interested to see now that meatless Monday has been kind of around for a while. I would be very interested to like look at a graph of how much meat is sold on like a daily breakdown and see if like Sundays or, you know, if, the, if there, that's like a, a trackable change in, I'm sure it would be very location dependent. Of like, course. I don't, I don't yeah. think that like rural Texas is going to see a whole lot of, of change, but maybe Austin where you have, you know, right. a, a kind of a, a higher concentration of people that might be participating. I, I just think that'd be very interesting. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of time here and talk about, we had an excellent conversation about the Henderson Island project and how it kind of wrapped up last year and the impacts of that. I'd love to know a little bit about where Howell Conservation Fund is headed and some of the other projects as kind of like snippets of, of what other amazing things can we expect from your organization? Absolutely. And thanks for that opportunity. Yeah. So really, as we look at it, right, you know, we run large scale projects sometimes, right? The Henderson Island projects really are representative of that because the Henderson 19 project put us on the map. It wasn't finished. It was really important to me to get closure on that and finish it in 2024. It took five years to kind of put the right partnerships together to make that happen. Right. But it's really kind of finishing our founding story as I think about it. The other projects and space kind of coming back to what we started talking about with these intersectional ideas and environmental entrepreneurship is that we give out a set of catalytic grants every year to really launch new concepts into the world, right? Or e either the first external market validation or either maybe the first grant. Maybe it's a concept that an established nonprofit has been thinking about, can't get their board to sign off on. Maybe it's a totally new concept that's not even a nonprofit yet, right? So we did a global RFP, request for proposal, end of last year. I think we got about 40 different applicants. We ended up funding eight of them at 5,000 each. And we really look at this as it's enough money to get you going. We're not an award system like Ocean Exchange. We're part of that broader ecosystem. So we funded everything from AI and kids trying to do things around education to local tribes looking at conservation technology to better protect their forests to helping look at oil rigs and how you decommission them, right? There's a really good blog we have on our website, howellconservation.org, that kind of goes into what all those are. So that's certainly keeping us extremely busy. We yeah, also, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. We also look at things, and this is, again, where we kind of draw from all these different areas of we actually make direct for-profit investments in mission-aligned companies, right? Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation kind of had the money to figure out how to do program-related investments and take the IRS on and kind of prove you're allowed to do this, which allowed small organizations like us to do that, right? So part of how we build relationship, and it's really a continuation of deep collaborations make for-profit investments in companies. So we have a couple, you know, I think of these plastic challenges as front of pipe and back of pipe. Front of pipe being, can you stop the production of plastic to begin with? Back of pipe, if the plastic's already been produced, what in the world do you do with it? So back of pipe, we have an investment in a group called CRDC, which stands for the Center for Regenerative Design and Collaboration. They're out of Costa Rica originally. They have a product that effectively can take any kind of plastic, resins one through seven, their product's actually called resin eight. It's a cement aggregate that can sequester carbon and they've now managed to scale this worldwide, right? So they were supposed to take the Henderson plastic from 2019, that's how we built that relationship. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. also another group called Lollyware mm -hmm. that sounds like you're familiar with. Yeah, um, I am. She, um, I think maybe she sits on the board with them, but she was one of the moderators yesterday. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. I should text her. I didn't realize she was here. We keep <laughs> missing, speaking of connections. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's a front of pipe solution of let's not make plastic out of petrochemicals in the first place, right? It sounds like you're very familiar with that. It's more of a seaweed based resin, started with straws and cutlery, and is now kind of scaling to being able to make many other kind of products out of that, right? So it's really, we're multifaceted 
in that sense, coming back to it, we want these intersections, we want to catalyze these new ideas, and we want to get to breakthrough conservation outcomes. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all of your stories. And we can't wait to keep up and see what you do next. And you're in Atlanta, so you're not far from us. So I'm sure we'll keep in touch. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Thanks for the opportunity. The thing I really enjoyed about that episode was how Brett talks about like, you know, we don't expect to go back. It's a huge undertaking and it spends like so much fuel and so much, so many resources to get out there at all. And so they've kind of set up this plan where now the people who live close to the island can help take care of it and can utilize those things that wash up. Like he said, they have like a science center on the island now and are going to be potentially taking tours over there and can repurpose the buoys, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's not sustainable to spend a million dollars every 10 years to go clean up the beach that's just going to keep getting trash on it. But it is sustainable to work with a population that lives there to find ways to turn that trash into livelihood and part of their tourism industry and stuff like that. We didn't know we were going to get that with the story, but that was a super fun discovery that we got to learn while we were interviewing Brett. Yeah. And, you know, with that being said, I think we can all continue to do better with our plastic consumption because at the end of the day, the people who live on this island aren't creating this waste. You know, it comes from around the world and just happens to end up on their islands in that island chain. So, you know, I think we have all learned some things here. I mean, hopefully that's the whole point of the nonprofit, right? (laughs) So if you guys were listening to that, and had some interesting questions that you thought of and you want to know more, you can find us on the Spotify app. We've got an open-ended question there for you guys. Let us know what you want to know more about. If you don't use the Spotify app, that's totally cool. We love you still. You can find us on Instagram, send us a DM, or shoot us an email by going to our website, conservationconnection.co, not com. It's not co. People ask us if that's a typo all the time. It's not. We couldn't afford the .com domain. (laughs) Yeah, the .co domain was so much less expensive. So if you do have a question for us, you know, send it our way and we will share those on next week's episode and update you on any of those great questions that we get from our listeners. Speaking of next week's episode, very excited. We're dropping the interview that we got with Dr. Sarah Fritz of Texas State University. Um, She is looking at how wildlife moves through a space and how human use of that space changes their movements. So specifically, we get to tell a really interesting story about bats and how they respond to wind turbines. It's sort of this wicked problem of we want renewable energy sources, so we have wind turbines, but that can have really negative effects on flying wildlife like bats and birds. So she's sort of trying to understand how we can have the best of both worlds, protect the bats, and also be able to utilize some of these amazing wind resources. And funnily enough, uh, she and I actually grew up in like the same little town just outside of Atlanta. So (laughs) that was a really weird connection to make, but super exciting. There's so many funny connections we make in this work of just talking to people. I love it. I love people. And so like (laughs) seeing that this amazing bat, what's the right word? Chiroptology? The study of bats. Sounds right. Something like, we're just going to roll with that. That she came from the same town where you grew up is just so funny to me. Yeah, it's crazy. And our final note is just to let you know if you love our show and you want to share it with your friends, that is so helpful for us to bring in new listeners so that more people can hear these amazing stories that we get to tell. Like I said, you can share it with your friends. You can leave us a review on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen. You can subscribe. And we also have a donate button on our website. So if you feel inclined to donate to our nonprofit, you can find it on our website. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with us. See you next week.